Welcome to Geek Philosophy, where we love geeky wisdom. My name's Brian, and thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to join us while we work on our campaign setting, The Guardians of Getica. If this is the first time you're joining us, welcome. If you are one of our playtesters and you're joining us live, thanks so much for uh, joining and, and being a part of this whole project as we um, kind of push our way through all of the development and playtesting and everything. If you're catching this on the recording, no worries. If you have ideas, go ahead and add them in the comments. Uh, we are going to be sure to check those so that we can grab the, the great ideas that you might have and make them part of the campaign. So, um, yeah, I'm going to get right in. Oh, actually, before I get right in, just wanted to uh, give, do a little bit of housekeeping. If you are new to the channel or you just watch our Guardians of Getica stuff, you're just in for the gaming for kids type things, uh, it's sort of a wide open channel about all things tabletop role playing. So we do things from game master tips to sharing our opinions on different things that come up. One of our special series that we have is Critical Cafe. So uh, you can join us uh, weekly for Critical Cafe, mostly weekly, almost always weekly, uh, where we go live and uh, talk about the latest and greatest about Critical, uh, critical Role. So that's uh, Crystal and myself that are um, going through that. We actually have um, a couple of videos that are sort of special editions of that. So lots of stuff for you on the channel if this is the first time that you're watching. So um, just wanted to put it out there. I, I, I put out a poll recently and it's kind of split the people that are into just general tabletop role playing game tips. Um, then there's others that watch us for our critical role stuff. And then uh, as you might be tuning in to, to right as you may be tuning into us for now, it's uh, Guardians of Getica stuff. So um, anyway, uh, we're going to jump in. I sent out some information last week when I sent out the link for this uh, live stream for all the playtesters. Um, let me just say hello to everybody that's joining into the chat real quick. So yeah, whoop, there we go. So hi from uh, Crystal and Ethan. And let me see, I'm going to use yours to make sure that we have the right background set up. Aha, there we go. So hi, Crystal and Ethan, <laughs> who are in the other room at our place. So uh, thanks for joining us. And then we also have, oh, hey, it's Ben. Good to see you, Ben. Thanks for joining us as well. Uh, glad to have you back in the chat. And again, anybody else that happens to join, Feel free to jump in the chat. Let us know that you're here and as we talk through stuff. So uh, I'm going to go over some of the things that I sent out last Friday, last week. Um, and this was the updated uh, campaign setting guide that we have been working on as we've been discussing this and I've been working on in the interim. Uh, so this guide went out to everybody that's in that playtest group. So if you aren't a member of the playtest group, uh, there's a link down in the description below you can join and that way you will be able to catch these live streams and, and join us while we're speaking live on the stream but also you'll have access to all the playtest materials that we are um, using so uh, this guide was again just put out uh, last week it's updated with content around the setting specifically um, one of the things that we talked about on the last stream was that we're really trying to move away from too much crunchy rule stuff because I want this to be applicable to pretty much any setting or most tabletop role playing settings. So you could use D&D, you could use Pathfinder, you could use a rules light system. Uh, I, I just want the feel of the setting and the characters to kind of really be the main thing. So I'm just kind of scrolling through as I'm talking just so you have something to look at besides my ugly mug. So. Um, We've done everything um, like updating the information about the Royal Academy and the Kingdom of Gattaca. Um, we've uh, got a description for the cover identity, like what everybody else thinks the Guardians are, uh, as well as some of the other groups. Like the Guild Coalition is something that's big in my homebrew world in general, but it specifically kind of eked its way into this campaign subsetting as well because I wanted them to be sort of like the sponsorship of the kids that are going to attend the academy, almost like scholarships type of thing. So the Guild Coalition is a coalition of all of the different guilds of the realm. Um, 
it gets when you have the regular you know four teens and up kind of campaign i've got a little bit more political intrigue with the business side of things and stuff like that going on but for now it's just sufficient to just say that they are what they are they're a coalition of all the guilds that are sponsoring um, some of the people that are attending, they're paying for a lot of the stuff that's going on along with the, um, the crown. So it's sort of a joint effort. I spelled out a little bit more about the history of the guardians. I went into this idea last week a little bit and just kind of made sure that it was, uh, sort of fleshed out a bit where we have the kingdom, uh, of Getica that in the past, in the kingdom, when the King Tomoth II passed, his daughter Aurelia ascended to the throne. She was at the age of 14, and she helped form the Guardians. So, um, yep, so, oh, yeah, that's where I heard it before. Go, Yeah, exactly. So a lot of the stuff from this is all stemming from my homebrew campaign world of Ventus. Um, so if you watched that stream, then, yeah, you've heard of the Guild Coalition. Uh, and maybe seeing some of the darker aspects of, of what they do with the Guild Coalition agents and all that kind of stuff. Who, by the way, side note, Guild Coalition agents, um, ironically, with everything that happened with Blotzy this year, I won't get into that, but uh, that whole agency of um, road agents are kind of based on the Pinkertons a little bit. So you can kind of play a character that is kind of this... Uh, uh, anyway, um, we'll get into that in another stream, but... Uh, yeah, it's 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 part of my my overall larger world um, of Ventus. We get into the headquarters, Ironwood Forest. These are blurbs for now. Um, I want to say that this will be expanded a little bit more as we flesh this out. Um, you know, we'll have all of the songs that we have so far. We'll have some tips on creating songs. Um, but here's one of the things I wanted to stop on for a second because this I really tried to flesh out a little bit more worked with both uh, Crystal and Ethan as we talked through this stuff. Um, and that is the fact that the Guardians sort of take a pledge when they are joining to battle against the Frights. And joining the organization, the basic pledge is to spread the message, reconnect with the Elders, protect the realm. So those three components are largely what they're trying to do as they venture out and go on all these missions right so and when i say the message that is all of the things that are sort of baked into the lore that help people avoid the fright so it's the rhymes and the things to do the stories that they kind of plant so people are doing these things without them knowing that they're really uh you know staving off all the flight the frights and warding against them but also spreading the message to the youth that will see them and the elders that will see them. So um, this is part of what we mean by the message. And then reconnecting with the elders, it, that's kind of a double thing, right? So it's not only going and learning from those that uh, came before you, because remember when the el elders sort of start to remember, they may remember things that these younger guardians hadn't even experienced yet. And they're remembering those things from when they were children. So having that connection is completing the circle right and then as the years go on this keeps the battle going and it keeps the information from being lost so this is sort of something that is also for those of us that are you know that have kids or you know um, try to teach our kids to respect their elders and to listen to them and to learn from them and to listen to their stories there's a level of that in there too right it's kind of baked into the game that um people have experience and let's learn from that experience but it also in the same way um lets those elders know that you know what these kids know a thing or two as well right we can learn from each other there's new things that are coming about that you can learn about as you get older too so i just like that whole core message that's behind the game um and then obviously the easy one is protect the realm right you're, you're battling you're, you're vanquishing you're doing all those things to get the the frights gone away so with that Earning badges as a guardian is sort of um, broken into these three main categories. That doesn't mean that these lists won't grow, but for now I have five in each category. So the spreading the message category has things like the lorekeeper badge, where you're discovering uh, important secrets, the cultural ambassador badge, where you're helping people from different 
places and cultures and everybody work together. The Bright Whisperer badge, if you remember from our last um, session, we sort of added this element of having brights to the campaign as well. And these are the good spirits that may sometimes accompany the guardians and befriend them and almost act like familiars, but they exist along with uh, the, the frights that are in the world. Uh, the Harmony Badge, which is earned by helping solve a disagreement between people or because we have the fairy folk baked into this game as well, maybe the bargaining that might be done with the fairy folk to get some help. Um, and then Trailblazing. So these are the first group of badges that are here. So um, let me scroll down a little bit. Um, there we go. I put together an oath for my guardians to recite along similar lines to the pledge. Uh, hardest part was keeping away from the rhymes. <laughs> I love that. I think you should run with it. Like, uh, you know, the the whole in, in brightest day and blackest night uh, rhyme scheme is one of the best things in comics. Like, it's just one of those things that you just kind of remember for years and years and years. Right. So I love that. Um, and also, I have to say that, like, again, this is just the baseline that we're putting together it should change. Like when you are playing at your table, you should make it into whatever you want it to be. So yeah, go with a rhyme, go with the brightest night or, or uh, blackest night uh, type of scenario. So um, here we go. Guardians of Getica, this we swear, though frightful foes we, though frightful foes may seek us with blade and spell, we serve with care, protectors, explorers, keepers. I love it. This is great. Uh, this is exactly the type of stuff I was like, you couldn't make me happier than taking this stuff, running with it and making your own. So this is amazing. So hundred percent. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, this is great to see. All right. I'm going to keep pushing through. Have you come up with or think of anything about these badges as we go through? Please let me know. Um, and then the second part are the elder or reconnecting with the elders. So these are like elders lore badge where you're, earning this from listening to an elder story and gaining knowledge for the guardians. And we're going to talk more about how this works in just a minute when I get to the other file I included last week, but um, bear with me until we get through these. Um, the cultural liaison, kind of what it sounds like. You're connecting with elders from different cultures. The wise mentor badge, you're um, finding a wise elder mentor who guides and teaches you some lessons. Um, the generations badge you're helping kids and elders work together like we just talked about like have, helping the generations come together um, and then guiding light badge they earned by an elder who is introducing you to a new bright that they worked with in the past right so you have to remember that these badges can be earned by both the guardians and the elders possibly right like they're also members of the organization in a similar way that some um uh, Boy Scout, Girl Scout, Scout organization leaders also earn some honors because of the work they've done with the kids, right? So uh, you can also have this work for the other players at the table that may be, um, you know, adults that are playing with the kids at the table. Protecting the realm, we've got the Guardian Defender badge by defending a place or a group of scary frights, or from a group of scary frights. The Master, ugh, can't talk tonight. Master Tactician badge. Uh, earned by coming up with a plan to outsmart the, the fright. So this can be something that is just encouraging people to think out of the box and really figure out like what do they do um, when they're faced with these problems with the frights. Um, healing touch badge uh, for magical healing to help your friends. So this kind of helps those that are, um, it, it's, it's <laughs> you know, for those that have had clerics play at your table, uh, that we're a little stingy about healing. <laughs> this helps with that, right? Like, so they've got something to uh, to do to help their friends. Um, Shadow Stealth Badge is by moving stealthy and uh, Nature's Guardian Badge by protecting nature. So all these things are, are related in a lot of ways to the roles that we have. And I'm going to jump over to the roles in just a second. I just want to go through this, that this is going to be laid out in the guide sort of almost the way that you would have classes, but these aren't, I, I should specify, and hopefully this makes sense. So I'm gonna to pause to make sure that everybody on the, on the in the chat kind of feels the same way about this. To me, 
the roles are things that are just your part to play within the group, right? And so being able to be a protector isn't necessarily tied to a specific class. However, if you're playing a game like D&D, um, a protector likely would be a martial class. If you're using that class, that can kind of go along with it. You can still play a fighter. You can still play a paladin. You can still play other things. So um, just to, but if you're just playing a very rules light thing, this is the title that you have in your job in the, in the group, right? So that's kind of where I was going. So let me pause there while I pull other things in to the chat. Players love the guardian badge sheets and immediately started ticking off achievements toward their first badges. This is great. Uh, we'll need badge stickers as soon as possible, please. Yes, we're, we are working on those. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for that. And I'm glad that it worked. So um, this is sort of, you know, uh, kind of self-explanatory as we go through. So I am going to jump over to those sheets now, these roll sheets, just to kind of give some people that haven't seen them yet a chance to take a look, um, but also to get some feedback as we go through. I really wanted to make this almost so that if you weren't using a rule system, you could make one up on the fly with these. Um, but if you are using a rule system like D&D or Pathfinder or something like that, then these fit really well with existing classes. They're pretty general as far as um, archetypical type abilities that they'll have. But the, the thing is, if we're trying to teach kids how to play a role-playing game, I wanted to put good tips for playing the role. Like the role of a protector uh, is to be brave and strong and ready to defend, defend the realm, right? So I wanted to give them a list of a few things that will help guide them as they play. I stand strong and I stand strong against the frights. Uh, my primary responsibility is to protect my fellow guardians and the people of Getica from harm. So they know this is my main job. Uh, the second thing, I shield my friends. So I use my skills to protect my friends in battle and make sure that they can face challenges with courage. So again, this is leaning into any of the martial classes really, but it could be anything else if you're playing a game like D&D you want to use. Um, I defend the innocent uh, in times of danger. I rush to shield and protect innocent bystanders. And I am a symbol of courage. So being that inspiration, it gives someone that is a younger player the chance to go in and uh, be those things. I also have to mention that we have not said, Guardian Protector, this is an apprentice. Guardian Protector, this is a full-fledged guardian. Guardian Protector, this is an elder. This goes for all of them. So if you're an elder, you're, you have the same jobs as everybody else. Your other level, that kind of level of, of nuance to that is because you're a little older and you've done this before, you're obviously going to help those that aren't you're working, you know, together with the, the people on your team. But I didn't want it to be so, um, I don't know, fractured that each one of these needs its own age group because everybody really is serving whatever role they are in the team in a similar way that um, if you're playing a fighter or a cleric, your age doesn't matter as much. It's just, this is the class that you have, right? So um, your skills as a protector are martial prowess and battle tactics. And those are the two main things that we want protectors to be able to do, they're protecting. Then we get to the special abilities. Um, what I did here was I said, you know what? Let's just have three special abilities. We'll keep it simple. The first two are baked into the role. So we've got uh, Fearless Defender and Protective Presence are sort of special abilities. You could work these into any other rule system the way you want, um, but it really narratively, they, they kind of uh, fit pretty well. You could do this with advantage and disadvantage with um, a game like 5e. You could have someone have the frightened condition if they are within a certain amount of feet from you, whatever you want to do. You can adapt this however you need to from these uh, special abilities perspectives. The thing I also wanted to do was make the third one that you had something that you learned from your friends. So each one of these roles, you can select one of the three that's listed. So maybe you decide, oh, I want my martial 
you know, protector to be a little bit stealthy. So I would say, well, I've learned some things about explorer stealth. Or maybe I want to play a little bit more of a magical fighter, so to speak. Well, let's go ahead and get the arcane insight from the keeper. Maybe I wanted to play it a little bit more like a paladin-esque type character. Maybe I would have healing touch. And that's kind of the idea behind it. So I'm going to pause there and see if there's any other comments. I'm going to go back to the chat. I know we've got a couple of things in. Um, I think the roll sheets work on several levels. They give inspiration without being too prescription, but they also give young players. Yeah, exactly. The cool gear was something we definitely wanted to put in. Fun fact, it was on the back of the sheet. Uh, I used to have a back of the sheet um, and it just didn't really make sense. And I think Crystal and uh, Ethan can both attest to this. It was like, no, we want that gear on the front so that you always can look at it and you can check the things off. So, um, and again, this is not limiting. This is just saying Guardian Headquarters has given you some stuff. Choose the three things that you want from them. And then you could have other stuff based on whatever rule system your class lets you have and all those things too. So um, I think that's, uh, that's kind of good. I think it's great. Keeps it simple and sweet. Thank you very much. And we've used, I learned from my friends to represent new abilities gain when leveling up. Yeah, this is great. Um, particularly when multi-class levels. Yeah, this is kind of the idea, right? Is like that you're sort of multi-classing or it gets into, again, I'm just using 5e as an example. I'm not trying to prescribe everybody play D&D, but it's the most common role-playing game, the most popular one out there. So um, I'll speak to that just to kind of make it a little bit easier. But um, yeah, so it, it's almost also tied in with the subclass idea, right? Because in 5e, you could play an Eldritch Knight fighter, right? So even without having to multi-class, being able to have a little bit of extra stuff that you can uh, go with is is pretty useful. So, but I love the fact that you're already thinking about like how this would work from a multi-class uh, class perspective. So that's great. Um, awesome. So the rest of these kind of go in a similar way. So those of you uh, that are seeing this for the first time, explore. You're uh, navigating. You're more the technical uh, kind of skillful person. So think. If you're talking, again, 5e classes, think ranger, rogue, that kind of stuff. So you're a keen observer, you help lead the way, you adapt and overcome, and you embrace discovery. And all of the things that you do there sort of, or that you're good at are kind of aligned with that. So uh, precision strike, um, you know, call this whatever you'd like in any other game system, but this is just a way of saying, well, maybe I'm not wielding all of the weapons that a protector does, but maybe my, preci my precision strike is with a bow, or maybe it's with a quick short sword or something. You can narratively say it however you want. Stealth is pretty self-explanatory. Then they have the special abilities of trailblazer and adaptive strategist, and then again, they get to pick from one of three uh, other choices that kind of round them out as their character. And then finally, we've got the Guardian Keeper. So this is the mage slash healing powered person of the uh, group is sort of a, a way of, of kind of explaining that in one role. Um, so you can kind of go either way with it. Uh, let me jump back over. I see some stuff coming in. Our explorer, explorer, a six-year-old, great a battle master fighter. That's awesome. Yeah, uh, yeah. Having the battle master six-year-old is just making me want to hear the stories of how that went. So uh, we'll have to hear more about how that gameplay went because it's just that is amazing. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So here we go. So with the keeper, we've got preserving the guardian lore. I want to pause here for a second and say that I thought it was important because of the whole main concept of the setting of people forgetting things when they reach, you know, the age of 18 or whatever you want it to be. Um, and then regaining that knowledge as they uh, reach their elder years, the whole idea of there should be people that are really good at record keeping and really good at researching things or uncovering mysteries. Um, and we've all, known uh, those kids in school that are just naturals at reading and uh, love uh, looking into things and finding out more information and uh, are really great note takers and this gives a chance 
uh, for someone to play something that they may be, you know, really close to, right? The, the, the person that wants to just, is just a natural learner and they love that. So we've got the, I think, a lot of different archetypes from a game perspective, but also I feel as if, you know, you can have a lot of different personalities as a child and pick up on something that you can connect with. You could also play against type, right? Like you could be a very studious kid that never really was too athletic and felt like, oh, I want to be the athletic person for my character. And that's completely fine. Let them play a protector or an explorer or something. But I just wanted to make sure that there was a way of maintaining the lore um, from the kid's perspective. And then they may connect with an elder that also can kind of teach them new stuff. So, uh, and then it also makes sense that if you're studying stuff, you know how to use some magic in a fantasy world, right? So um, weaving magic, guide with wisdom, heal and empower. So outstanding skills, you've got casting spells uh, and medicine. So both um, real, you know, sort of tactile first aid type medicine, but also healing ability is, is something else that we've given them. So those two things that they've got for special abilities are arcane insight and healer's touch. Um, so however your game system wants to interpret that, that, that's what they've got. And then again, they choose from one of three other things that they've got. Okay. Uh, this was on every one of the sheets so far, all, all of the different roles. And we've got the guardian gear at the bottom. And uh, these are, uh, I was back and forth. Uh, what do you guys think is three a good number for this? I was kind of worried about doing too few or too many. Um, I tried to group them a little bit by what I thought the roles would pick from. Uh, you know, like first one being a little bit more protector oriented over here with spear, sword, shield, and axe, and then camouflage cloak, uh, rope and climbing gear, bow and arrows, and dagger a little bit more on the lean from uh, the um, explorer and then wand staff amulet and lore book being obviously keeper stuff and then the last row being things that anybody would probably pick up but you're not limited I didn't make the list be this is what the protectors get and this is what the explorers get I want them to be able to pick any three that they want right so um, you may notice uh, if you remember some of our first test adventures that uh, we had a rhyme about um, frights that were um, that's a good question is the backpack empty uh, I would say that's left up to the game master if they want it to be full of clothes and extra food or whatever type of stuff I mean I'll let them kind of decide I didn't really spell that out it's a good question though um, but you may remember from the lore and, and the rhymes that we had about the uh, frights that are afraid of um, crafted light, meaning torches or candles, light that people make, lanterns too, right? So I made sure to have those on here just in case. Um, three items is a good start. And again, it's good inspiration for future. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, you may also kind of decide I'm going to give a bonus item for everybody after a certain thing or whatever it might be. So, um, yeah, I think this is, it's a good start. Um, I agree. Okay. So then we have this guardian's pledge, uh, she, and to me, this could be printed on the back of each one of these so that they've got sort of something that they can do. I feel as if, um, this is something that you could do at the end of every session. Uh, you could have your, and, and again, one of the things I try to um, make sure that I do is explain that I think that the missions that they go on should start at headquarters and end at headquarters. Try and, trying to keep the adventures down to um, a time frame that works for, depending on the, the age range, obviously, uh, works for people with an attention span that may not be extremely long <laughs> like it, it helps right but also it's a challenge sometimes especially if you're playing with your if you have a kid that's playing at your house and they have friends that come over and they want to play too it lets you change the mix of the group every time and it could be different guardians assigned to a specific mission so um, by starting and ending at headquarters every time it lets you 
have a different group that's going on that without having to say, well, we have to camp somewhere at night and then pick up from where we left off. And then your friend couldn't make it back and you're stuck camping because you don't want to continue the game without them and things like that. You obviously can do that if you'd like to. You can do it however you want. It's just I thought that this would be a good way to mitigate that a little bit is to try to start at headquarters, end at headquarters. And ending at headquarters can be a great way to kind of go, oh, hey, did you take any notes while you were on your mission? Or why don't you guys take a minute to write some notes down? And then let's go through and see, did anybody do any of the things that are here? If they did, did they get a check mark? By the time all three are checked, they earn that badge. You can earn badges multiple times. You can earn more than one Lorekeeper badge. You can earn more than one Culture Ambassador badge. If you're really doing a lot of great stuff, there's no reason not to award these things. Um, but I think three seemed like the good number to earn the badge. Um, but again, letting them know that they can earn multiples is something that I think would be helpful too. So let me go back over. Yeah, torches, lanterns, and, can lanterns and candles um, are the things that kind of help keep those night frights away. So, um, and I got some agreement on the other stuff. Yeah, great. So this is, I think, you know, it's shaping up a little bit, guys. I think this is getting a little closer. Um, obviously, we're not 100% where we need to be there yet. You are not wrong that the, <laughs> we, the, the Candela Obscura party sheet is an inspiration for this too. Obviously we did it, um, you know, uh, differently than they do it in Candela Obscura, but I, I, I love how they have that baked into the game. So no, this is uh, definitely a little bit of inspiration from there and, and glad to hear that you're watching that too. We, we, um, we really like how that system works from a game perspective. And to be honest, that Luminous World system could be a really great way of playing this from a mechanical perspective too, of doing dice pools instead of a D20 plus type system. Um, easy to play, easy to learn after you've done it a few times. Uh, so anyway, so I, I agree completely. And yeah, you could have Lorekeeper one or one, two and three if you get more than one badge. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great, um, great way to do it. Or you can, you know, narratively they can say, oh man, you, you look over and you see this new guardian that just joined your joined your group, he's got four lore keeper badges, or he's got four, uh, you know, one of the defensive ones. Let's say he's got four uh, guardian defender badges. Man, he must be really good in battle, or she must be great at at her uh, healing spell. She's got three or four of those healing touch badges. That's great, you know. So it's also something that you could build into the description if they come across other guardians or. If uh, you know the elders kind of talk about it too, so it's 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 a great way to do it. Mission starting and ending at HQ definitely works well for the monster of the week playstyle. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think that's kind of where I was going. I think of it almost like you know, again, uh, if you remember the the old school cartoons of of like the eighties and stuff, where uh, yeah, the story kept going, but. The Thundercats had a mission of the week, right? <laughs> like, even though the story, there was a little bit that drove the story forward, uh, you could tune in and, t for the most part, G.I. Joe and the Thundercats and all those guys back in the 80s that were doing things, they had an adventure a week, and this gives a chance to go do that. And the team might have shift uh, every week, you know? So that's kind of a, a way to go, I think, with that. So, um, yeah, stage badges. <laughs> yeah. Uh, He's got that flair. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, this is great. And, and and how you choose to visually represent the badges as far as like how you do wear them as a character, that's something that the table can discuss too. Um, we will likely have some standard stuff when we get the art together. Um, of, I don't know if it'll be like a bandolier, like Worf's bandolier with the sashes, like, you know, maybe like almost like the, the way the Girl Scouts do their stuff. Um, or if it'll be more of a military style where they're maybe on the chest, like ribbons uh, and medals. Uh, Scooby-Doo, Inspector Gadget. Yeah, those are great, um, great examples of that too, right? Like, so uh, I love the, the, the Scooby-Doo idea too of going and uncovering the mystery. That's kind of a good thing. Although with this, you may be lucky to have the same uh, team every time going around in that mystery machine, but you may not, and you may have different kids playing and different adults playing. So the composition of the group 
is a little different. So in some ways, I almost think of it like uh, I'm a comics fan from way back. It's almost like the way the X-Men or the Avengers um, would uh, have a mission and they would have a certain number of people on the team that were maybe specifically chosen for that specific uh, mission to go do stuff. So, um, you know, another thing to do, Mission Impossible, obviously a little bit more of an older skewed thing is a, is a good way to, to look at that as well. So, um, so yeah, so that's kind of where we're going. I, I am just to give you a little bit of um, uh, information about where we're going to push forward with this. I'm looking at trying to figure out like page entries for specific frights. Right now we've got a few different uh, varieties that I just mentioned, but I'm going to go and sort of do a list of several frights with art to make sure that we can capture what's there, but then also give a little bit more specifics on how to create them. Um, yeah, I like this too. So, uh, uh, so a charm necklace, or uh, if you have the backpack, you can put the patch on there. That's a great idea too. You can use it on your back patch. I love it. Um, so uh, we've got the varieties. We've got some discussion about uh, battling, vanishing, and warding against them. And then a little bit about how to adapt frights for the game. Uh, we've did a little bit of a write-up on the brights, uh, the citizens of the kingdom. Uh, I like the backpack idea. Yeah, I think that's a good one. Um, it it kind of goes with, with what's going on uh, all around. So uh, inside of the cloak, maybe. Yeah, 100%. You know, it's funny. In the uh, Rangers Apprentice series, um, which a little bit of inspiration from there, too, um, each one of the different... Um, roles within that world um wear a badge wear an emblem and uh for uh, the rangers they wear the oak leaf and the oak leaf pin uh is sort of showing them in the different the gold it's like bronze i think or gold depending on if you're an apprentice or a full-fledged no silver versus gold anyway the type of metal denotes whether you're an apprentice or a um, full-fledged ranger it's a great series if you haven't um, read it I, I, it's definitely for younger readers but it's it's really well done I've taken some inspiration from there they also have a, a brother band um, series that talks of, that is taking it from the perspective of uh, a nautical almost Viking like um, seafaring type adventure it is really good too um, okay, so back to here, we've got the citizens of the realm, other people that are helping. We talked about this a little bit last time, animals of the realm, the fairy folk. I did want to put this note uh, to the game master in here because I, there's one thing that I'm a little bit um, wary of every time I do something like this. Whenever we put in or we build out um, fantasy campaign world. Um, oh, sorry. Let me come back over here for a second. So the Guardian Gedica spearhead emblem is very neat and evocative. It would also look nice as an acrylic inspiration token or a, a pin badge in an Etsy store. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's a uh, that's a great uh, great point. I'm I, I might be refining it a little bit, but the idea of the spear is that, uh, and thank you for bringing that up. The spear is the main symbol of the Guardians, and uh, from the perspective of the populace, it's like. Uh, they, we are sharpening the hearts and the minds and the spirit of our youth. So it's like that type of thing. Um, but also, it's like a perfect weapon for the frights. You've got your Asteri spear head and the ironwood, uh, you know, body for the spear, the, the the shaft for the spear. So yeah, it's like a perfect combination of stuff. So that's where we um, kind of went with that. But I'm once I can make sure that the logo design is going to be refined probably as I start working with an actual graphic designer and artist. Um, my stuff is okay and it does the job to kind of get people brought in, but there will be a slight redesign uh, for some of this stuff and the artwork will hopefully be great and evocative and kind of help with what we're doing. So, so to kind of go back to this, one of the things about fantasy genre in general, but especially in role-playing games that I try to be conscious of is that um, a lot of these things are drawing from folklore of a lot of different cultures. And while a lot of the stuff that we've got in this guide is leaning more towards European-based 
um, fantasy cultures and sort of the norm of what we've seen from Tolkien forward, really, and, and other things as well. Um, I do want to kind of make a conscious effort to put a note in for the Game Master, and I'll do this throughout, that it doesn't have to be that. It could be set in uh, any um, type of realm that you would like based on any real world culture that you like. So um, I didn't want to lean too far into the fairy folk and say that all of your fairy folk type characters need to be, you know, exactly Celtic and European or Scandinavian based for all these other things. So I added a few things. I did a little bit of research and added some things in so you can adjust things. So maybe you want to have uh, a little bit more of a feel of like the yokai from Japanese folklore or, um, you know, any of the, the Mimi spirits from the indigenous Australian lore or anything that you can think of that makes sense. Um, the Aziza from West African mythology. So they don't have to be a direct analog, but again, do what you want to do at your home table. But without saying this, I didn't want anybody to think that they couldn't make those changes. Although everybody should know you make all the changes you want for your own game, but it just feel like I wanted to bring this up uh, where I could to make sure that people know that this is as open as, as you want to make it. So, um, and then a little bit about adventure prep uh, and running the adventure, starting, you know, bringing back badge opportunities, kind of coming up with some ideas for some of those things. And here's that whole thing about adventure recap and badge evaluation um, that we just talked about. So this is the end of where that guide was. It's about a good 21 pages uh, ish of content. Uh, I didn't include any adventures in this yet. I'm going to be doing some. Uh, revisions to the originals and then kind of creating another uh, couple adventures that we can go out to make them a little less 5e uh, forward and a little bit more story front so you can uh, you know put them into whatever system you'd like um, but yeah this is this is where we are so um, we're gonna keep moving forward with this I, I am planning on I know we talked about it a little bit I am hoping to do a Kickstarter for this before end of year. So anything that you can do to help me spread the word to get people um, going through uh, the materials that we've got so far so that we can get the feedback, but also just spreading the, 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 the word so we can get a successful Kickstarter. Um, one of the reasons that I want to do it that way is because I really want to bring on some professional artists and layout designers and people that can make this something that's pretty great. So we're going to work on fleshing out the content as much as we can, but then probably putting some effort into getting a sample that can be used first, that is playable, or at least, you know, a small snippet, like a quick start version. And then we can use that during the Kickstarter to at least give someone an idea of what everything would look like at the end, when everything's worked on and finished and, and what they would get if they decided to fund the project. So um, we'll see. I still have to go through. I've never done it before, so I've got to go through all the the budgeting and what is it going to cost? So I've got emails out to people in the industry to kind of find out uh, what kind of uh, advice that they have. And um, yeah, so we'll, we'll see how this turns out. I will keep you posted. I'm going to keep doing this. And like I said before, if that falls flat and we still don't get everything kickstarted, this will come out. It'll just take some form that's a little bit different, but I'm going to make sure this gets out in the world and you can always use whatever materials we've got as we put them out for playtesting. So um, let me come back over to the chat. We're going to wrap it up here in a second, but let me just make sure I've got everybody. We've been playing through the Dragons of Stormwreck Isle starter set and looking for ways to splice it into Guardians of Gettica. Yeah, I also, I have not done my review yet, um, so I'm going to hold these up to camera. Um, when I can do a, f a full review, I I've been reading through, but the, I, I mentioned it last time that there was a D and D adventure club. So let me see if I can, so there is a quick start guide and they're in like sort of the smaller pamphlet type of form and ooh, this is not working. There we go. And, uh, ooh, I dropped stuff out of it. So you get like, um, some really good quick start information. This is a very rules light, um, if you look up D, &D Adventure Club, they actually have their character sheets on the site. But not only are the character sheets, what you're really getting with, with D, D Adventure Club is they send 
um, some uh, a, basically a module every month, and they kind of go together in a way. So and, and really good artwork on the inside. Um, so again, I'm going to do a full review of this, uh, and hopefully I'll get a chance to talk to the creators of this and maybe have them on the channel to kind of get a, a better idea. But let me just, so here's the kind of stuff that it does here. So tips and tricks. So each one of these seems to have, and I don't know, I've only got three, but it seems to be that they help teach the game through each one of these adventures. So one of the tips and tricks, hit points and unconsciousness. And then it goes through some information there about how it's done in 5e, but then they give the adventure club option. So for beginning players or young players, character death off the table and consider heroes knocked out at zero hit points or simply unconscious. And then they explain the rules as written and how it works. So they kind of really do a good job keeping it rules light. Um, this one is called a giant problem. Artwork is really, I think, well done. Um, I will, again, explain more as I have a chance to do a full review, but for those of that are interested in like adventures that may fit this perfectly, and I think they're probably a little bit that's gotta be revised, and when I dig in, I'll find out um, what I think about it, but that may be a good spot too, is uh, something like this. So just um, just putting that out there. Uh, they, they are not affiliated yet. I'm hoping to work with them at some point, or at least to get some kind of a relationship going where I can uh, find out a little bit more about what they're doing over there. Um, but they haven't paid for this. I'm not, I'm not advertising for them or anything yet. I just wanted to share what I have. Uh, if that relationship changes, I will let you know, but, um, yeah, yeah. So it's really, really well done. I like how they're doing. It. And again, if you head to the, it's D with the N D N D as in like what you would do for D and D beyond D and D adventure club. Um, you can check out all their stuff and, and find out what they do, but yeah, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's great. I think it's a good place to start and, uh, I hope to get into this a little bit more detail so I can find out more, but, um, that's about it. All right. I'm going to pause for a second because I'm going to wrap it up here, but I just want to see if there's anybody else that had any comments before we finish out because I think I ended too quickly last time. So I don't want to do that again. All right. Giving it a second. I'll scroll back up to the top here to buy some time while I'm waiting. All right. Okay. Thanks everybody. Uh, it's been great catching up with you again. Hopefully uh, we will continue this uh, same time next week. If you again are watching this on the recording, don't forget to head over to the playtest link and uh, you know, make sure you sign up so you'll get the link for these so you can join live. No cost for any of this. It's just, uh, I don't want to hit everybody with stuff that they're not interested with on the email list. I just want to make sure that people are actually signing up that want to know what's going on. So, uh, oh yeah, one more from Ben. Brights will make a triumphant debut at the end of the starter set. That's awesome. Uh, as a reward bestowed upon the bronze dragon when parting with seat. That is great. I love it. That is uh, such a great way to work it in. Um, and I can tell they, they've they got a great DM. So uh, good, good job for... For putting all this together it's and this is how you know how things work right like you get some great minds thinking uh together on some stuff and uh we can put something together that'll be really worthwhile so all right everybody um i will uh catch you next time and i uh, hope everybody stay safe take care